Welcome to Not For Pie Eaters. I'm John Dougal. Today I'm wearing my Game Over t-shirt, not because uh, I'm against marriage, but because I'm against bad marriages. You know, marriage has sadly become an institution that ruins the lives of men and that sets up children to see marriage as something that's going to eventually fail, helping them to later in life repeat their parents' woes. Today's video could go in the people playlist or in the wisdom playlist, and I picked the latter since unmarried viewers need to figure out how to avoid disaster and there's some wise choices that you can make. In society, general unhappiness is at an all-time high. Young men are checking out, they're not going to school, and when they get out into the workforce, they're being out-earned by young women. And the women, you know, they date socioeconomically equal to or, or greater than. So they're stuck chasing after a small pool of men. And we know how that's going to end because, you know, for most of the women, they're going to shag the guy, but they're going to lose out because he's going to pick somebody else and he'll become the one that got away. Well, eventually, if they want to have children and a family, they're going to settle for some guy that's lesser. And the lesser guy will never measure up. And she'll always be thinking about how she could have done better, and he'll always be a disappointment in her eyes. Losers for everyone, you know, for the whole family. Well, men need to be men to make marriage work. There's definitely a lack of masculinity, and women are not going to respect a guy that doesn't hold up his half of the deal. Today, however, we're going to look at just the woman end of the equation, the woman problem, um, we'll cover men some other time. We're going to look at, basically, for men, how to choose better. We're going to start with a poem that I wrote about 15 years ago. It's about an old guy who spent lots of time just observing what's going on in this small town where he lives. And it's the kind of poem that uh, evokes visualization. So I'm going to help you out just a little bit with it with what that setting looks like. So picture an old seaside fishing village. There's fishing boats coming and going, and there's the dock there where the town is, where the boats are moored. And there are several boats, and the, so visualize the fishermen and the captains for the boats coming and going and walking about on the dock. Visualize town folks interacting with the fishing industry. You know, there could be a processing plant and dry repair docks for the boats, and tourists that occasionally come in. Now picture an old fishmonger who sells the, the day's catch to the townsfolk and the tourists, and he watches everything that goes on near the docks day after day, just as he's done for years. Well, a fishmonger wraps the fish he sells in newspapers before he sells it to the customer. Have you got the picture? The poem is called Dearly Departed. Dock life gives me time to ponder, broken men who are prone to wander, some who seek whores who live out yonder and will forfeit much to the bonder. Other men seem dissipated, as if their hearts were perforated, their life force long gone, abated, wrecked by the frauds to love who hated. People label man as a beast, yet never wonder how his life ceased. What man would want is woman least. His life is lost and he is fleeced. Son, wisdom teaches not a twit, but those who have both light and wit. So grab a chair and set a bit, and hear a tale of the worst way of it. While wrapping fish some blood did wet, upon an obit and blow type set, I saw the hag in black hairnet, sniggering o'er her dead nutless pet. Their lives did flash before my eyes. I could see it all to my surprise. Poor dead bugger, I did surmise. The sad truth of life it, he did despise. And this is how their story goes. A gentleman caller with courtly bows. And all the time it snows and snows, obscuring the poison that she sows. His foggy head cannot conceive the mask he wears to deceive. If only truth he could perceive, his life he would save rather than grieve. Instead, she sets her wedding day, the day she'll finally have her way, and plan his life without his say, a day to celebrate. 
His purpose to bring her delight, the bastard who returns late each night, he always sulks within her sight. He's nearly celibate. Her children come, her will be done. His life is now a setting sun. In name only she is his wife, and every day she rules his life. If he objects, she brings him strife. Hell and heartache have both run rife. But peace'll come, he longs for it. It'll come, he's damn sure of it. It will come when he's departed. One last fart, then off he's carted. Happy at last, now that I'm dead. That's how the obit should have read. Oh, what a waste of way to live. His heart was a scabbard for her shiv. For wisdom he had not to give. Please learn from him and live. Please live. Well, marriage could be like a brief union of two praying mantises. After copulation, the male mantis is nothing more than the female's next meal. And there's those who think that marriage is just an option to a long-term relationship. Um, that's not how the courts see it, especially if there are children. And about 50% of marriages end in divorce. Many marriages are absolutely miserable, and I think it's a pretty reasonable guess that about half of the marriages that don't end, end up in divorce are miserable. That means 75% of the marriages are bad one way or another. And family court heavily favors women. So what does that mean? In relationships in general, they are a risky proposition for men. You know, but what are you gonna do? You know, are you gonna be a monk or never have anything permanent? It's critical that men pick women of outstanding character. And it's like the old carpentry saying, Measure twice, cut once. You know, a man needs to pick the kind of woman who's going to be his true partner in life. The kind of woman who'll put in the effort to make the relationship work. But men are notoriously oblivious to the ways of women. And that's that was the point of the poem when I wrote it. The crux of the subject for today is awareness of the wretched women out there and how to ferret them out you know, before you ruin your life. For our wisdom quote, we're going to go back to you know a few we've looked at before, and that's in in Genesis is where we're going to start. You know, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and ate from the tree that they were commanded not to eat from, God told them the curses that would be upon them for their sin, and one of the curses was spoken towards the woman in Genesis three sixteen. Your desire will be for your husband, and he'll rule over you. This is understood by theologians to mean that the woman will desire to rule over her man, but he's still going to sit in the driver's seat, or at least try to, because God's intent for Eve was for her to be a suitable helper for, for Adam. So the curse is relationship conflict, where the man will want to take his role as high priest in the family, but the woman will also want to be in control. And I'm convinced that the root problem in most marriages is control. And the Apostle Paul alluded to this when he spoke in 2 Corinthians. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she's not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in, the, in this life. And I want to spare you from this. In good marriages and good relationships, men and women resolve this conflict. But from the man's perspective, you know, when you're dating, what are the signs that conflicts are going to be ever present? On the screen is a continuum. On one end is neurotic and on the other end is character disordered. A common saying among mental health professionals is that if a person is making themselves miserable, they're probably neurotic. And if they're making everyone else miserable, they're probably character disordered. But you know, even on the neurotic end of the continuum, there's grief foisted upon others, especially if you're, you know, living with a neurotic person. Neurotic individuals display negative emotions, pessimism, insecurity, anger, anxiety, depression. Well, at the very least, it's exhausting to be around these negative emotions. And we should be clear that women are more prone towards negative emotions than men are. 
And what happens, you know, if a neurotic woman, you know, has these things and expresses them, she's, she's going to try to offload some of the responsibility for the feelings and the emotions onto the men in her lives. You know, she's going to take her insecurity and try to make it his responsibility to deal with it. Um, if she's angry, then it's going to be his fault. And, uh, you know, he's going to have to give her an account, you know, and so on. But, you know, these negative emotions, it's not a man's burden to carry them. It's not a man's burden to, to carry the woman's insecurity or his responsibility to try to curb a woman's anger, or it's not his responsibility to try to resolve her pessimism. You know, the best a man can do is show a little compassion and then remove himself and let her deal with her feelings on her own. You know, if you try to do more than that, she's just going to suck the life out of you. And she's certainly not interested in your attempts to try to solve her problems. You know, logic and reason is what men always seem to go to in these kind of conversations. And it's just going to make her angrier because uh, she's going to see you as being uncaring. You know, in a nutshell, a neurotic woman is going to wear you out because she's not dealing with her issues. Well, let's look at the other end of the continuum. Let's look at character disordered. In a nutshell, character disordered individuals want to take something from you, and it's something that they have no right to take. You know, on the flip side, they have no sense of reciprocity. There isn't any teamwork. You know, for the character disordered, it's a team of one. Um, you know, there's only one sin for the character disordered, and it's them not getting what they want. So, such people are going to fail to contribute in one way or another. They may give some, but it's usually in the expectation of trying to get something in return. So don't expect fairness. Um, in various degrees, character disordered individuals lack a conscience. And people make the mistake of thinking that they have a repressed conscience. It's like, nope, <laughs> you know, there's nothing there to repress because uh, they're not going to feel shame. They're not going to feel guilt. You know, and they're not going to show any restraint. So... Men need to stop with the nonsense of looking at women as angelic. There are sinners, and there are women, and there's women that are worse than others who are character disordered. Um, I'm not going to get into the personality disordered on this video. It, it would be way too long, maybe maybe in another day. But you, you should probably try to learn a little bit about you know female narcissists and female histrionics and sociopaths and definitely the most prevalent of the bunch, borderlines. Um, what it will cover for today is a little bit on covert aggression, just barely scratching the surface, because character disordered women are going to practice some form of aggression, and the form they favor is covert aggression. Um, both men and women are aggressive, and men are generally direct in their physical. Um, women are not direct, they're generally verbal, and so women are going to exhibit aggression typically in, in, uh, in the verbal ways. When it's somebody that they're not particularly close to or somebody they want to cut out of their life, then they're going to spread rumors, use innuendo and gossip and character assassination. Um, but if it's somebody in their life, then there's another form, which is the covert aggression, you know, also known as manipulation. With covert aggression, there's a determination to win, and there's no fear of consequences. Um, the best way to look at covert aggression, I, I think, is using an analogy of the martial arts. A person who's good at covert aggression, think of them as like a fourth-degree martial arts black belt. They're seamlessly switching from one tactic to another, from one move to another, in a very well-practiced kata. Some of the tactics of covert aggression are shaming, evasion, minimization, rationalization, uh, denial, lying, selective attention, selective inattention, diversion, playing the victim, you know, and on and on it goes. Well, they can not only switch from one to the next and use all of these techniques, but they'll seamlessly go back to the ones that they've used before and bounce all over. Uh, what ends up happening is, is, is 
the person that doesn't realize what's going on, they're trying to carry on a logical conversation and, and, and get to a point. And the point of the covert aggressive aggression is to just always stay in control and switch from one tactic to the next and keep the opponent off balance until they've got what they wanted. And let me tell you right off the bat, if you're unfamiliar with the tactics, you know, you're like the inexperienced and ignorant white belt that has no idea what you're up against, you know, and you get thrown into a ring unbeknownst to you with a unmerciful martial arts master. And you're going to get bloodied, you're going to get decimated, and you're going to lose. You know, I could dive into the specifics of these tactics, um, but for now, let's just go with a yes or no question. Do you understand these things? Your answer is probably no, and God help you. You need to understand and how to recognize the tactics of manipulation and aggression. You, you could become the poor dead booger in the poem who for wisdom had naught to give. Um, the better solution altogether, though, is, is to uh, avoid the neurotic end of the continuum, avoid the character disordered end of the continuum, and try to find women that are in the center who are neither. Um, and I, I guess I've got a few words to say on top of that. You're not going to figure out who's who with a short conversation, especially if you're all enamored with her curves and her angelic face. You know, it's a, better to think of a woman as, as being from one of two tribes. She's either a liar or a truth teller, and it's your job to figure it out. And she's not going to tell you what tribe she's in. It's whatever you come out of her mouth. You don't know if she's a liar or a truth teller. So you got to figure it out. And you do that by not paying so much heed to the words coming out of her mouth, but by observing her actions over a long span of time, all the while not becoming sexually mesmerized by her. Okay, that's how you figure out her true character. Okay, a few more wisdom quotes. Um, the first is from Ecclesiastes. And I find something more bitter than death, the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and whose hands are fetters. That's the woman we were just talking about. And then in Proverbs 21, better to live in a corner of the roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Well, in summary, you know, don't put it, trust in a woman's sales pitch and her, into her words. Um, watch her actions over a span of time and judge her by her actions only. Hopefully they match the words, but be open to the possibility that they don't. And then if they're not, then you need to bail. Never rush into marriage. Never rush into children. And be aware that if you're intimate, she can make the decision for the children all on her own. This intimacy puts you in grave danger, and she can destroy your life if you've been intimate. An evening in the sack is not a fair trade, you know, for a ruined life. I could go on for hours and hours today, but um, I'd probably have to split up some of these other topics into other videos. You know, we could dive into neurotic behavior. We could dive into abnormal psychology. We could go into the detailed moves of covert aggression. And uh, we can go into and discuss what healthy boundaries look like and then, you know, how to deal with people that aren't healthy. But, you know, it's basically better if you simply avoid getting in a relationship with, with troublesome women. Choose better. And uh, sometimes better is not picking anyone at all if no one better is, is not available. You know, it's uh, better to not get on the train than to get on it and have a train wreck. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please consider giving the video a like in return. It's what makes the channel work and uh, what helps me make this thing um, available for more people who can use it. Cheers.